give my opinion and carry any. Oh, oh, it's Chris Avalon Unfiltered, bitch. Well, hello, 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 everybody. Welcome to a brand new episode of Chris Avalon Unfiltered. I am your host, Chris Avalon, and... You know, basically, this is basically a show where we're going to get into all the latest celebrity news, entertainment news, hot topics, anything that got to do with entertainment. We talk about it on this here show. So with that being said, please do yourselves a solid and and myself a solid as I always try to in, interject into that situation and hit that like button, that subscribe button and that notification button. So that way, you know, when we go live with a uh, the app. Uh, <laughs> I'm not having a stroke. I was just, I got tongue tied. So that way, you know, when we go live with a brand new episode of Chris Avalon Unfiltered. So I would have posted this on Facebook, but apparently Facebook is playing in my face. Apparently they said I posted something that went against their standards. So I'm in jail for three damn days. Um, or is it two days? I don't know. But they didn't even tell me what it was. So like the picture, the thing is up there. The algorithm is algorithm in. The picture, I don't know what it was, so I just got to fly blind with, okay, so I posted something that went against your situation, but you're not going to tell me what it is. Whatever. Meta, go fuck yourselves. But anyway, so we are live on the YouTube and we are live on the Twitter, Elon Musk Twitter, um, at the moment. And we got a lot of tea to get into. So, child, this morning, you know, yesterday, Chandler was vindicated over her sexual assault allegations with Daniel McGarrigal, but Roller Stone did a um a full on expose and bitch in the words of Whoopi Goldberg, Molly, you in danger girl. So we're gonna break that article down. Plus, um, the director of Leaving Netherland has some scorching words for Antoine Fuqua's upcoming Michael Jackson biopic and trust and believe he called it a whitewash. So we get into that. Plus, we got a lot of tea on Wendy Williams. I was going to talk about this yesterday, but there was way too many articles that was, I mean, that I had to touch up on. So I was like, let me just save it for today's show. So, you know, the Guardian's lawsuit has been unsealed. We also know how much money she was paid, allegedly, for that docu-series that she did where we saw her brain and everything else deteriorating before our very eyes. So we got that story. Plus, um, she's been hit with a federal tax lien. She hasn't paid her taxes since what was it they said 2019 or something or another so we're gonna talk about that plus speaking of money and finances bruno mars has been caught up in a 50 million dollar gambling debt so we're gonna break that down plus shakira a week before i mean a couple of days i should say before her new album first album in years is dropping she talked about how she put her career on hold for her ex Gerard pk so we're gonna bring that we're gonna talk about that plus mauricio umansky is saying that the separation with kyle richards is going to play out on this upcoming season of his netflix reality show i believe it when i see it plus um, a friend of mine sent me this because they work over at Preston. So a gay councilman resigned in L.A. after a drunken urination video emerged and an alleged assault of the manager of Precinct in downtown L.A. has emerged all over social media. I saw a lot of the drag race girls was commenting on it. I had some people that I know that actually work at Precinct and sent me some stuff. And we're going to talk about that and break that down on the show. And I got the video and all that other stuff. Plus, I didn't know this, but apparently, I mean, I think I probably didn't know because they do, there's this thing that they do when they try to hire people and figure out, you know, chemistry tests and stuff when they do with shows. So apparently it's just more stuff that's coming out about Queer Eye. And there's a guy who was the guy who was chosen before that he was swapped out for Anthony Porowski says that he was switched out because there was somebody in the cast that's on the show now that pushed him out to have him replaced. Anthony Porowski. So we're going to talk about that. Plus, Wayne Brady is open up about how he's getting a lot of DMs. A lot of people sliding in his DMs and shooting a shot ever since he came out as pansexual. So we're going to talk about that and a whole lot more. But before we get into the topics, oh my God, what is going on? Do yourselves a solid. I'm just like falling apart on camera. And like I said before, hit that like button, that subscribe button, and that notification button. So that way, you know, we go live with a brand new episode of Chris Avalon Unfiltered. And let me hit my banner. And without further ado, let's get right into our first topic. I'm not even going to edge y'all. We're going to get right into the biggest topic that has just emerged this morning. So yesterday, we talked about that Shangela Laquifa Wadley, a.k.a. DJ Pierce. You know, what was going on with that case between him and the former We're Here assistant, Daniel McGarrigal, who I told y'all I had interviewed last year. 
in regards of, you know, what was going on with that whole case and that whole situation. So he came on, we chatted, nobody else was doing it. And I'm still surprised and I'll probably hit this home later on in this topic as I'm wrapping it up. Where are the gay blogs? Why are the gay blogs not talking about this situation? Y'all have been scapegoating and, and kind of acting like it ain't been existing in this whole situation, but I'm not going to sit and wait on you bitches to come out and, and do legitimate stories. If y'all not going to talk about it, then I'll come on and talk about it. It's because a lot of y'all are doing business with Shangela. A lot of y'all inviting her to y'all spaces. She has been booked and busy since this whole situation came out. So yesterday, it was right. We found out that back in February, they went and they did, you know, they had a mediation. They came to some sort of undisclosed agreement. Daniel had to agree to dismiss the case with prejudice. He could no longer refile. Da, 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 so on and so forth. So the whole thing's been situated. A lot of people I know went on social media, believes that Daniel took a settlement. If he took a settlement, because I know times is hard, and he basically, when we when I interviewed him, he said what he's not going to be doing is he's not, he doesn't want to work in those major corporations and type of space anymore. So he's been doing a lot of behind-the-scenes independent work on for independent companies. So that's what he told me when the interview and that's what he was going to do. I don't know if, you know, if I, I don't, I don't kind of, been going back and forth on whether or not I should hit him up, but I don't want to pry. It's kind of like I'm having that Nini Porsche situation where it's like, you know, when you want to give people a space, whatever happens, happens. Maybe part of the whole deal with him taking a settlement, if that happened, is the fact that he cannot spill any tea on what transpired in that case. Otherwise, that may be a violation of the NDA or whatever the case is. I don't know. I don't know legal jargon. I'm just speculating at this point because we don't know what really happened. But if you go on social media, particularly Reddit, a lot of people are assuming and implying that Daniel may have taken settlement. That may be the case, but this morning, after the dust settled, and I was like, okay, you've vindicated, whatever, whatever. Child. Now, Rolling Stone then came out with an article which is basically saying, like, Shangela may have been, there's been multiple people, and where there's smoke, there's fire. And I've always said that. I'm like, okay, so we have one person that came out. It's only a matter of time before more have more have come out. And I even said in the interview that I did with Daniel that, you know, with him coming forward and doing this situation, because when I first talked about it, how he found out about it with me is the fact that friends of his saw my story on Instagram and shared it with him. And then that's when he slid in my DMs and we had a conversation on trying to figure out when we were going to actually do the interview that we did. Cut to now. Rolling Stone, like I said, did an article and seemed like multi a multitude of people have come forward since the allegations. And so I'm going to read you the Rolling Stone article so that way you know what the T is. So it says, this investigation, which began in November of 2022, is based on 16 months of research, court documents, and interviews with several accusers. Over the course of reporting, Rolling Stone uncovered a previously unreported police complaint filed in Los Angeles and multiple independent accusations spanning several years alleging sexual coercive and assaultive behavior by the drag star. Now, five people independently described nights out with Pierce where they were between the ages of eight 18 and 23. All five said that Pierce clearly, nearly, sorry, doubled their age and fresh off headline graphic spots on the silver screen and award show red carpets, drank with them through the night or through the late hours of the night and into the morning. <clears throat> The accusers all said that they were acutely aware of Shangela's celebrity status. Three people said they were aspiring drag queens. One of the sources claimed they got so drunk they vomited in a hotel bed moments before they were allegedly assaulted in the same sheets. Nearly all accusers said it took them at least months to process their alleged sexual assault. Now, I, before I finish reading, this is the same allegations and to the T that Daniel also said when I interviewed him, and his story has never changed. Let's continue. The alleged interaction spanned from 2012 to 2018 in Louisiana, Texas, California, and the United Kingdom. Pierce was has maintained his innocence, but admitted to meeting with four of the sources on the dates of the alleged assaults. Pierce said he does not remember the fifth accuser. Controversy around the drag star initially erupted last May when a production assistant named Demi McGarrigal, working on We're Here, filed a civil lawsuit against Pierce and his employer Buckingham Television, alleging rape in L.A. after having filed a police report against the star in Ruston, Louisiana, 
Initial shockwaves rippled through drag-related social media, with the LA Times breaking the story. A rep for Buckingham did not respond to a request for comment. McGarrigal, who was 40, alleged in a lawsuit he threw up from drinks provided by peers before he woke up to the drag star rubbing his member against his butt. Ticks. It says buttocks. So I'm just going to finish. I was like, I had a you know moment. Anyway, attempting to insert himself into his anus. The lawsuit claimed Pierce thrust inside of McGarrigal while saying, I know you want it and you're going to take it. All parties reached a settlement in February and the case was dismissed. Rolling Stone can confirm through details remain, though details remain undisclosed, Pierce did not respond to questions about the civil lawsuit. This case has been resolved and the defendants of the council acted in good faith. This is what Daniel M. Gillian, McGarrigal's lawyer, tells Rolling Stone. As such, I feel it will be inappropriate to discuss this matter or its resolution. I don't know anything about the new allegations, but I certainly recognize the courage it takes for a victim to come forward. Three sources who spoke to Rolling Stone had spoken to BuzzFeed News, which was set to publish their allegations last year. McGarrigal also spoke to BuzzFeed News, but declined to participate in this article. When the Pulitzer Prize winning publication shuttered in April 2023, the investigation into Pierce was never published. Two more accusers stepped forward during Rolling Stone's continued reporting. Now, all five sources who spoke to Rolling Stone identify as queer and have participated in or watched drag shows, citing anti-drag and anti-trans laws across conservative states in the U.S. They all grappled with the decision to come forward with their allegations, but they all said they wanted peers, not the queer community, to bear accountability for the allegations. Now, before I finish reading that, I want to reiterate that because I totally get why because people, why they ain't come forward? Why they do this? Why they do that? It's because of this. A lot of times when it comes to male-on-male assault, men are afraid to come forward because you're seen as a weaker type of person. Then you have that political aspect that's wrapped around it where you think where people, see, I told her they was deviants. See, I told her they was perverts. One rotten apple should not be the, the whole situation for an entire community. Chandler does not, I mean, allegedly, you know, if this stuff is whether or not it's true, alleged, alleged, alleged. Shangela is not a representation of the entire community. She does not represent all of us. So there are people in the in our situation that are LGBT that sexually assault. It's no different than what straight people be out here diddling with, with you know, doing sexual assaults. Gay people do it too. But the fact of the matter is people are afraid to come out and say stuff because, yeah, there's that, that whole situation. See, now we need to go and push for the you know, banning of drag shows or the banning of this. So they try to lump everything under one umbrella. And that's why a lot of people sometimes get afraid to come forward when they should, if you go out and you assault people or you use your power to take advantage of people, you should be held accountable. So I totally get why they said that, um, you know, they don't want people to just come down on them on the whole situation but shangela has to bear accountability for their actions not the entire queer community so that's basically why i felt like i need to reiterate that but let's continue it says i'm very confident i was clear with my nose i was declining advances he still kept trying anyway this is what edward ramirez said one of the sources who spoke exclusively to Rolling Stone, a 27-year-old named Helmer, filed a second police report against Pierce. Helmer, who at 20 at the time of the alleged assault and is only using his first name out of fear of employment retaliation, filed a complaint in L.A. in June 1st, 2023, though due to a procedural error, the police department didn't return his report until December 20th. The LAPD did not respond to a crestful comment. In the complaint, Helmer told police that he was motivated to report his allegations after he read articles published by the LA Times that indicated Pierce was suspected of conducting similar sex crimes with other victims. He told police he met Pierce in 2017 while working at a popular LA bar where Helmer said he and Pierce exchanged numbers and social media accounts, saying, and I quote, I'm thinking we should hang out, Piers then 36 told Helmer in Instagram direct messages reviewed by Rolling Stone. Let me take you to a late dinner. The two exchanged direct messages and went out for drinks the following night. Helmer told police after they met, the complaint states, Piers bought a mojito from Helmer. He states he does not drink mojitos, but continue to have it out of respect for Piers. Helmer told police he does not have any recollection of the events that occurred after he drank the mojito. According to the complaint, Helmer recall waking up completely naked in a bed and relieved to be 
at Pierce's residence. Hummer asked Pierce what happened last night and he when why he was naked, the complaint said. Pierce responded with, we had sex and there was another guy involved that you brought in. Helmer asked who that other guy was and Pierce said he did not know, but you were really into it. Helmer told police it took him a few days to realize that he was SA'd, and by the time he came to the realization, he believed he did not have enough evidence to report the incident to authorities. Instead, he confided in two people, his roommate Jay and his current boyfriend Josh, in 2017. Rolling Stone spoke to Jay and Josh, and they are using their first names only to protect Helmer's anonymity. Both recounted hearing details of Helmer's allegation, including the mojito, the alleged S.A., and the second person present that night. I saw this young, sweet, scared 20-year-old boy breaking down in front of me, and I was crushed for him. Josh tells Rolling Stone about Helmer's first time opening up to him. Josh says he was proud of Helmer's decision to file the police report. Helmer did this effing scary thing in the scary sheriff's station that night. It was the moment I watched the boy I hugged in my bed crying in 2017 turn into a man who could stand in his truth and live past it with no shame. Brettler calls Helmer's accusation absurd, claiming that Pierce and Helmer went back to Mr. Pierce's house where they engaged in consensual sex with a third man who they met at a bar. Critically continued, Helmer continued to contact Mr. Pierce in the months following the encounter. Brettler writes, Helmer never once mentioned that Mr. Pierce mistreated him, let alone sexually assaulted him. Well, if that's the case, then I say, bring it up, bring it up, bring it up. So, um... It goes on and on and on. Like, there's a lot in here. And it says, on May 4th, 2017, less than two months after the alleged assault, Helmer texts Pierce to ask for help in finding an apartment. Helmer says the text was sent in desperation after breaking up with his then-boyfriend, who he had lived with. I'm looking pretty urgently, Helmer said the text message to Pierce. My plans fell through last night, and I need a place to live. Regarding Helmer's police report, Brettler adds that no one from law enforcement has ever contacted Mr. Pierce or his representatives about Helmer's bogus claims. Helmer's police complaint echoed allegations from four other people who spoke to Rolling Stone. Edward Ramirez, 27, claimed Pierce assaulted him after a night out in Texas in 2018. Rolling Stone reviewed Instagram conversations between Pierce and Ramirez. They met at a bar on September 10th and discussed plans to hang out on the evening of September 11th in the early morning. But Ramirez, who was then 21 years old, had a night of the 11th, took a turn of me out of his control. He initially posted his allegations on ATRL. What's that? I've never heard of it. Oh, it's a, an internet blog space for celebrity culture and analysis to describe his night. Pierce shoved me on the floor in the closet and tried to penetrate me. He wrote a few hours after the alleged assault. Honestly, he had just asked. I probably would have consensual sex with him, but getting shoved in the closet and thrown on the floor was just uncomfortable and it seemed like an abuse of power. I'm very confident and I was clear on my nose. I was declining advances, Ramirez tells Rolling Stone. He still kept trying anyway. When I shared the story initially, I was showing grace and mercy that I wouldn't have shown had I taken more time to process what happened. And it says, unlike the other accusers, Ramirez says he provided his own he provided his own drinks throughout the night. He adds he didn't go to the police because he distrust he distrusted police authorities in Texas as a black queer man. And that's another thing I think we need to focus on why a lot of people do not come forward, especially when not only is it that the police aren't the kindest when it comes to queer people and a lot of issues. If you watch many of movies over the years and many stories from Stonewall on down, we know how well the police treat the LGBTQ community. So especially when it comes to sexual assault, you most certainly believe, and especially if you're a gay Black man, first of all, you're gay, and you're Black, and you're a man. Three things that you're going to have going against you, especially when this racist-ass country we live in. So we can definitely see why it takes a lot of time for people to come forward with sexual assault, especially when it comes to man-on-man assault. You're always, it's always seen as a sign of weakness if, as a man, you cannot come forward and speak out on things that has happened to you. So I feel like we need to keep reiterating that and pushing that forward. Um, so it goes on and on. There's a lot in this article. I don't want to be sitting here spending 30 minutes reading it because, child, it is like, it's a lot. So if you definitely want to read the article, head over to my website, chrisavalon.com. I have the full expose there. The Rolling Star article... First of all, Rolling Stone, y'all irritate me because y'all be wanting people to subscribe and pay 
to read your articles. I wasn't doing that. I found a way around it. So I copied the entire article. I posted it on my page and I left my opinion on it, which is basically, you know what? At the end of the day, Daniel said what he said. And I believed every word when he came up on here and he read it because, you know, I'm really good with body language and energy and eye contact and how that comes out of people. Like I'm very good at reading people. First of all, Virgos, we excel at that. Number two. So with him saying all of that, I believed every word then, even though I've seen people in the comments on many of my posts where they were on TikTok, you know, and many other places, how y'all were kind of side eyeing him with this. So everybody on here can't be lying, right? Not everybody's out here trying to take down dear old Shangela. But like I said before, I don't understand why Out Magazine, Pink News, well, I don't know. Maybe I'll have to check up on them later and see if they actually do cover this. But I have not heard any of them. Those gay blogs, the ones that sit and live for Drag Race and all these other queens that come on there whenever it comes to certain things and when y'all invite them to the spaces because Shamla has been booked and busy, trust and believe, since these allegations and stuff has been coming out. Not this main one, because this came out today. But prior to, with the Daniel McGarrigal stuff, he was still getting booked. So... Why have y'all been silent on this? Is it because y'all worried about how it's going to look in the eyes of the people who could give a fuck about us, regardless, like the LGBT, you know, the anti-queer people out there? See, I told you they was perverts, deviants, and they go around assaulting people and doing all kinds of other stuff. Give a fuck about what those people think. The fact of the matter is, when people in our community, whether they do with good, bad, or indifferent, we got to hold their feet to the damn fire. But the good thing about me is I own my goddamn website, so I can put whatever I want to put on it. A lot of you people will be so busy trying to do business with people or y'all want to get an interview or whatever the case is. I don't give a fuck about all that. The fact of the matter is I'm here to give the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, or we get to around of that part of the truth. So that way the story gets out and more people don't feel afraid to come out and come forward with their stories and what i should do is since i put that up i'm gonna put that up there so if anybody out there has um been assaulted you know hit that number or go to the website rain.org so i want to you know I'm, I'm gonna do my part <laughs> to contribute to the community and i'm just gonna do what, what needs to be done because i'm not gonna sit up in here and you know i've always been the type is i don't wait around for nobody to do what needs to be done and things so yeah that the in the article goes on it's extensive it's full it's full on like explicit is a lot of stuff a lot of details and all other stuff and i believe every word so what is this whole so what does the future hold for chandler this is what i'm curious about is like okay so are we going to continue to turn a blind eye to this are people actually gonna is, is this gonna affect their bookings and stuff because look one little a uh, couple of situations came out about jonathan majors so many other people that's in this industry diddy all this other stuff y'all ain't been fucking with them but how come dear old chandler is still getting work why, why are we addressing this? This is something that needs to be discussed in our community, and these are things that need to be handled. It's the same thing when it comes to like things that go on in the Black community. Nobody wants to talk about abuse, um, sexual abuse, physical abuse, all kinds of different crazy stuff that goes on in the community, in the LGBTQ community. There's things in our community we, that our hands ain't squeaky clean of either, and we need to deal with and we need to talk about. And if y'all not going to do this shit, that's what I'm here for. As long as I got breath in this motherfucking body, I'm going to do it. So, let me know what you guys think down in um in the comments, what you think about this story, because I'm sure it's not going to go anywhere anytime soon and all this other stuff. And I'm here to find out, OK, so y'all going to take out a court? Is there going to be some type of settlement? What's all the evidence? You know, they did say that they have back and forth um stuff regarding, you know, DMs or whatever the case is. And we'll see. I'm, you know, I'm continuing to follow the story as it develops, because I'm sure it's not going anywhere anytime soon. And shout out to those of you out there that are discussing it besides myself but yeah let me know down in the comments below hey speaking of which i do see that we have comments felix says when i was essayed in eighth grade i told cops but they didn't do anything just like they didn't do anything when i reported my dad for hitting me yeah this is like the homophobia is real out here this is sort of like whenever it comes you're supposed to protect children you're supposed to protect you know everybody and protect and serve isn't that a part of y'all situation and the fact of the matter is that a lot of y'all don't do it then where is that how do how do people feel safe how do feel people feel that like they can go and run to the police and try to help them when it's like this the guy that i just mentioned said that as a queer black man he didn't feel safe enough to go to the police at the time 
to speak his truth. So I'm sorry for what you had to go through, but it's like the law, law enforcement, sometimes y'all could be so goddamn, y'all could be a waste of space. 2017, that must have been like just after All Stars. Oh, well, I'm glad you're doing the mail because I couldn't even <laughs> far back. I was like, Prob probably um, at the height of the career. And I do understand, like, when people are saying, like, you know what? Um, some of them were aspiring drag queens and thought, okay, so if I hang around Shangela, then, you know, because of where she is, and I'm sure that a lot of people do that, whether you're going to be assaulted by a drag queen or not. You're looking for that guidance and that mentorship and that mother figure of somebody who can come and take you up under their wing, sort of like, you know, what they do in the houses, when you have a mother of a house or father of a house or whatever, you know, in ballroom culture and that sort of thing, where you take people under your wing and it's like, you know, I want you to kind of show me the way and how I can get my foot in the door of, of doing local drag before I can get the opportunity of being on a show like Drag Race, because whether you like it or not, Drag Race does provide a lot of people with opportunities. So if I'm going to meet someone like a Shangela, it's like, yeah, I'm going to get in there for that sort of situation. But then it becomes, in Shangela's way, a quid pro quo type situation. But the problem with the quid pro quo is, you know, what usually what that means is you get something by giving something. And when the other person isn't in on the situation, you having to go around allegedly slipping because I'm with people sitting up here talking about they had stuff, but you know, they Chandler bought them drinks and all of a sudden they was feeling funny. So what is she slipping in their drinks? What kind of are you up in here slipping the date rape drug up in, up in their stuff? Because this is the same thing that you know Daniel said that he got so drunk, he went to a room, passed out, woke up, pan, you know, she's trying to penetrate him from behind and. Actually, he said that she didn't try to. She actually did. Because I asked. I said, was there penetration? And he said, yes. So if y'all, like I said, yes, if y'all have not seen that episode of where I interviewed Danny McGar Daniel McGarrigal, I did link that in the description down below on the YouTube channel, on my YouTube channel. So in the description, it has the, um, the, the link to the episode. You can watch it if y'all haven't seen it and see what Daniel was saying. And um, like I said, I'm going to follow this story as it develops, but let's move on to our next topic. And since we're talking about sexual assault and things, let's get into Michael Jackson. So, you already know there's a movie coming out called Michael. During, um, Antoine Fuqua is directing it. You have Michael's nephew, Jafar Jackson, playing Michael Jackson. Uh, Coleman Domingo is playing Joe Jackson. We got Neil Long playing Catherine Jackson. I heard Miles Teller is supposed to be in it, but there's an undisclosed part that he's playing, probably playing one of the damn attorneys. I did hear that there's going to be, they are going to be addressing the assault allegations where they said that Michael was going around diddling with the kids. And I gave my opinion on it when I first heard about it. I said, you know what? First of all, the family's behind the doc, the the movie. And you got family members actually in the film portraying Michael Jackson. We already know what the movie's gonna give. They're gonna give some sort of biased situation where they're gonna make, you know, whether we believe the allegations or not, they're gonna lean more on the side of, oh, he was just, it was just innocent because Michael's childhood and his father was abusive and he never really got to have a childhood because he became a superstar at six years old and never really got to do all the things that regular kids do because at six years old, he was out here working and making the family, uh, you know, famous until he went off and did his own solo thing. So the director of Leaving Netherland, um, where, you know, the film that he interviewed Wade Robson and James Safechuck and said that Michael had abused them as kids, he's weighing in on the upcoming film and saying it's a complete whitewash of Michael Jackson's life. And this is what he told the New Time, the Times of London. Well, it says according to the Times of London. I don't know if he told him that, but he said this. It's an out-and-out -out attempt to completely rewrite the allegations and dismiss them out of hand and contains complete lies. You never even see him alone with any boys when it is a matter of fact that he shared his bed with small children for many years. The biopic has drawn a pedigree team of director Antoine Fuqua, who made Training Day, and writer John Logan, Oscar-nominated, you know, who's 
Oscar nominated writer of Gladiator, The Aviator, and Hugo. I almost said Hugo, but that's also how you pronounce the name. Oscar nominated Coleman Domingo, as I said, will play Jackson's abusive father Joe, while Miles Teller will play. Okay, so now they meant they mentioned who he he plays. He plays John Branca, Jackson's manager. So that's the role that Miles Teller has nabbed. You know, he was in Whiplash and Top Gun Maverick. I actually like Miles Teller. Well. Forgive him for doing Fantastic Four, but <laughs> but it says the newspaper as of the music sales data suggests that Jackson's appeal is growing again after his star waned prior to his death in 2009. And it, it cites Sony's confirmation last month that it will acquire half of Jackson's catalog in a deal that valued his assets at 1.2 billion, the largest transaction for a single musician's work. And Bilbo reports that consumption of Jackson's music worldwide grew last year by more than 38% to 6.5 billion on demand streams. The musical MJ's uh, telling the story of the star's life and using his music has also arrived in London, fresh from success on Broadway, with German and Australian tour dates also scheduled. The musical makes no mention of the abuse allegations that Jackson face. Well, I know my parents went and saw um, Michael Jackson musical because they were looking for recommendations. And I remember because when I was and I had to hit up one of my Broadway friends, I'm like, what out there could they watch? Because I didn't want them to have, you know, my parents are pretty much, even though they're liberal, they're conservative in a lot of their ways with stuff, you know, boomer generation. <laughs> so uh, they were looking for recommendations. I was like, you know what? Well, go see the Michael Jackson play um, on Broadway. And this was, I think, before it was going to end. And she's telling me, she was like, it's only in Vegas. I'm like, ma'am, it's on Broadway. Like, I had to literally pop it open. They do have something over in Vegas. So she wasn't entirely wrong. But I was like, I had to literally go through the... Because it's like, with technology, you know, when you have parents, and then this is my generation, they don't know a lot about technology and stuff. So they went to go see that. They enjoyed it. And yeah, they don't mention the whole allegations or whatever, because I think it's a musical. They want to focus on everybody singing, dancing, hee hee, and all that mess. So, but the movie, I already said what it was going to give. So I don't know why they're surprised. Now, I will say this about um, the director of Leaving Netherland, Neverland. I don't know why I can call it Netherland, like the Netherlands. Leaving Neverland. I don't know why the director, first of all, as a director, you haven't even seen the movie yet. You were, he's pro- Maybe he's speculating based off of that report that came out where we did talk about on the show that there was a reporter who always winds up scooping people get inside scoop. I forget what his name is. I think it's Daniel Rick- Rickman. He basically gets scoops or whatever and he says, he said he basically leaked some key parts of not too much of it, but he gave us like some stuff that we should be expecting based off of what he read from the the script. And basically implied that they were gonna they were gonna address it, but they kind of make Michael look like he was a saint or whatever in the whole situation. Excuse me. Like I stated yesterday, when it comes down to certain situations, I'm not gonna be quick to judge what the script is giving until I see the movie. So I'm gonna wait for the trailer and give my opinion on that. But I'll go see the movie. And I'll give my opinion. If I feel like they were kind of whitewashed or do whatever, then, I, or, well, I don't know. I wasn't there. But I just give my overall assessment of how I felt about the movie. Now, if anybody else, being like the director of Leaving Neverland, wants to come and say, like, you know what, based off of all the research and all the things that I've done in regards of knowing this case front, you know, backwards, forwards, and sideways, and I'm looking at it and I'm like, okay, y'all just spoon-fed these people a bunch of bullshit. Like that same script with that Bohemian Rhapsody, where y'all fed them with all that on the mess and try to make it seem like that. Basically, y'all queer-washed, so y'all want to talk about whitewashing, you queer-washed um, Freddie Mercury's entire life because them bullshit backup members wanted to give some hokey whatever version of what they thought Queen should be. The movie made a shit ton of money, but I just called, I I just looked at that movie was just like a piece of, it was a bunch of BS throughout that whole damn film. But anyway, but it didn't Rami Malek get his Oscar for that role. I mean, he played the hell out of Freddie Mercury, but that movie was a piece of shit. I hated it. But this is another thing too, is like, I don't like biopics because I feel like we don't get the real deal holy feel when it comes to biopics and stuff but like i said before i'm gonna sit and wait until this film comes out and then once it comes out i will give my full assessment on what i thought about the film on whether or not did they were they throwing softballs 
when it came to the Michael Jackson sexual assault trial and what I truly think about the whole situation. I mean, I followed the whole that whole trial and stuff when I was a kid. I didn't really understand all that other stuff because I was too young. But like I said, it's like now that I'm older and more mature, more aware of of things, then I can kind of go and give my overall thoughts and 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 truly have a full opinion on things. Okay, so uh, so with. Oh, they skipped a lot of stuff in the Whitney thing. First of all, I heard a lot of people didn't even, well, you know, people didn't really care for the Whitney uh, movie. And I also heard of that recent Whitney movie that came out. What was it like? Maybe two, three years ago. I don't remember when it came out. Um, they they got sued because the music. I think it was like a music licensing situation that happened. Um, I can't remember the the story at the time I had, but I heard there was a I remember there was a lawsuit that happened with the Whitney Houston biopic over the music licensing and all that other stuff. I guess they told me they didn't get paid or whatever the case was. So um yeah, there's some drama with that. But anyway, so um let's move on to our next topic and talk about my girl Wendy Williams. How you doing? So there's a lot of Wendy Williams tea that we got up in here because first things first, we're gonna talk about her lawsuit. That was un- well, the Guardian's lawsuit against Lifetime, and them saying that they shamelessly exploited her amid her health problems. Because you know the production company tried to weasel their way out and say, "Oh no, we didn't. If we would have known that she was going through dementia and aphasia and all this other stuff, we would have stopped recording." But I was sitting there like, "Okay, if y'all sign the contract to do a documentary or a docu series." You got to post the good, the bad, and the ugly. I'm sure that the the intent going in, there's always intent going in to making a movie or making a documentary or making an album or making a lot of things. But sometimes when you intend to go in and do one thing, sometimes it morphs into something completely different. And then sometimes, unfortunately, the sensationalism outweighs the other stuff. Because we would have loved to have seen Wendy make a comeback. However, we all looked at Wendy long before that comeback documentary, docu-series, whatever was coming out, that Wendy wasn't of sound mind. We've seen all the videos throughout, you know, the years when she would be stumbling and and lo- completely delirious and lost and didn't know where she was half the damn time and falling asleep in Louis Vuitton. Like, we've seen all that stuff. So I'm like, well, wait a minute. How y'all agreeing to do a docu-series when we were seeing all this stuff popping up on uh, TMZ and then the many art, the many stories I was doing over here with my show, you know, we're on the line and all and everything else. We seen what was what was happening with her, but y'all had to. But Will Selby, uh, uh, you know, apparently had time to sign contracts and and pushes you know his meal ticket out there when we clearly saw she wasn't ready. But anyway, let's get into the story. And it says Wendy Williams, court appointed guardian Sabrina Marcy is calling out lifetime. Why am I itching so much today? <laughs> my nose. Don't worry, I'm not on that same shit as Bruno Mars, so. <laughs> the burger sugar. Um, or Andy Cohen. But anyway, allegedly. Uh, Wendy Williams called a point of guardian. Sabrina Marcy is calling out Lifetime's parent company, A&E, in his docuseries, Where is Wendy Williams for shamelessly exploiting a star amid her challenges? Now, this story comes from the Hollywood Reporter, so we'll go in and continue. The complaint, which was unsealed on Thursday, claims that the contract A&E Network's brokered to shoot the documentary was not valid, since Williams did not have the legal or mental capacity to authorize her participation in the title at the time. She was allegedly told that the film would be positive and beneficial to her image. It remains unknown who created the company that entered into a contract with the network allowing Williams to be in the film. This blatant exploitation of a vulnerable woman with a serious mental medical condition who was beloved by millions within and outside of the African-American community is disgusting and it cannot be allowed states to complain. Now, in a statement, a and Network said, we look forward to the unsealing of our papers as well as they tell a very different story. The controversial four and a half hour documentary, which contains footage from roughly seven months of Williams's tumultuous past few years until she entered a health facility to treat cognitive issues last year, aired as planned to blockbuster ratings, averaging slightly over a million viewers across the two nights. It was broadcast on February 24th and 25th. Lifetime said it was the biggest nonfiction debut in two years. Williams, her son, Kevin Hunter Jr., and her jeweler turned manager, William Selby, are all credited as executive producers. 
The legal battle stems from Sabrina Morrissey acting as in her capacity as Williams' temporary guardian following a lawsuit last month in New York County Supreme Court against any networks to block the documentary's release. It sought to temporary restraining order, which was granted before it was reversed by a higher court. Appellate Justice Peter H. Moulton found that stopping the company from airing the documentary would be an impermissible prior restraint on speech that violates the First Amendment of the Constitution. Since the case was kept sealed, Morrissey's agreements to stop the network from airing the title remain unknown. Morrissey declined to comment, citing court orders prohibiting communications with the press. Any networks did not immediately respond to a request for comment. According to the unsealed complaint, the documentary footage was filmed pursuant to a contract signed in January 2023. Williams, however, lacked the capacity to enter into the agreement, the lawsuit says. Pointing to a court-appointed guardianship, Williams was placed under in 2022. Morrissey claims that the former talk show host was incapable of managing her own business and personal affairs and indeed was placed into a guardianship and under the supervision of this court. Now, here's the thing with that, because it says that she lacked the capacity to enter an agreement, right? And it also said that she was placed in 2022 under a conservatorship because she was incapable of, incapable, sorry, of managing her own business and personal affairs. So she was in the guardianship, right? So why the hell would she hit with a federal tax lien where she's not even capable of paying her own damn bills, where it said that it was far more more than 500000 so half a million dollars in unpaid taxes. And this is according to TMZ. And I'm going to get into that in a second, but what I want to say is, like, if that was the case, then how is she here with this lien? Like, isn't it Sabrina's job as her conservator and person who's managing her affairs and her coin and stuff to be paying her taxes, making sure her taxes, everything is paid, so she's not out here running crazy with no, you know, getting hit with tax lien? What y'all gonna do, put her in jail? Like y'all did Wesley Snipes? So it also says that William Selby, acting as William's manager for the project, made representations to Morrissey that he... Um, that he would have final creative control over the final cut and that it will portray Williams in a positive manner. Saying, like a phoenix rising from the ashes after her TV show was canceled due to her medical condition, per the complaint, based on these representatives, Morrissey allowed the project to proceed with the understanding that nothing would be released without her and the court's approval. Instead, a trailer for the documentary was released without notification. The Guardian was horrified by the release of the trailer and its contents, which falsely depict WWH's, that's Wendy Williams Hunter, behavior, and demeanor as being wait hold on i was like why did this say my camera went off and anyway let me continue um demeanor as being the result of intoxication rather than the result of her medical condition which has been diagnosed by doctors at will cornell and i have to say this if will selby pulled a stunt which i truly believe he did i keep telling you he is not innocent in this whole situation and this is wendy fault because wendy be hiring people that have no tact number one and number two no they have no no inclination on how the industry works. She just be hiring like you just like she could just pull somebody off the street and say, like um, I'm thinking the white woman in, in um in the color purple. You want to come with me and be my maid? She's gonna be like, you want to come be my manager? Like when did you give me that? Like you just see somebody all of a sudden you just gonna pull them in and make them your manager? And it's like what credentials do these people have? And besides somebody that you know that you cool with that probably gives you discounts on jewelry, how the hell are you gonna hire this man who don't know you know his ass on a hole in the wall? the ability to manage you. And I truly believe that because I remember prior to the docu-series, he was out here, oh, Wendy's doing fine and she's she's ready to get back out there and the podcast, 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 podcast. We kept hearing that over and over and over again like a broken goddamn record. And I'm looking at this lady like, there's no way she is in a, any kind of condition to do a podcast. It took a lot of y'all to see this docu-series to come to that realization, but I came to that shit from the beginning. I'm sitting there like, what's going on with her? We didn't know what was going on with her. We didn't know about the dimension we didn't know about the aphasia we didn't know about any of this other stuff i'm sitting there thinking like this lady losing her damn mind in real time and she out here fucked up from the alcohol because you could clearly see the lady was drunk wobbling everywhere she could barely walk so we sitting there thinking it's a lymphedema we thinking there's all these other medical ailments that she has always been forthcoming about and us not knowing about the other stuff which was the fact that her brain was deteriorating because of the amount of alcohol that she was drinking excessively daily 
and the people that were probably encouraging her because, you know, in Hollywood, as long as they, you know, make you happy, they don't care about anything else. So I truly believe that Will Selby saw a moment he was looking for because they wasn't making no money elsewhere. He saw an opportunity to exploit her. He did the reality, you know, they agreed to the reality series. And they thought that they could control the narrative. And they could control how she was going to be portrayed on camera. But I always tell people, the camera don't lie. They can, you can only do but so much to try to manipulate and do whatever but when it comes to producers and cameras. They, the truth is always going to find its way out. Everybody can act prim and proper the first couple of days, but once you get used to the situation, you start to see the real people. And so they had seven months to get all that stuff out there. So I'm not going to necessarily, so let's play devil's advocate. Maybe Sabrina didn't know. Maybe Sabrina was like, okay, so we can agree to do this, but I need to see footage. I need to see this. I need to see that. And Will was like, yeah, I got you. And then all of a sudden, they put the thing out there and you didn't even know it was coming, which I can understand why she's furious. So we'll see, you know, with her presenting this whole court case or whatever, if she can get something out of it. So I will definitely keep my my um, eye on this story as it develops. But before we move on to the whole tax lien story, I do want to point out that um, according to reports, especially I should say Radar Online is reporting, that Williams was paid $400,000 for, li- for that Lifetime docuseries plus a, a $1,000 daily stipend. Now, Radar Online, you know, they said reveal the details of the project's contract, which her legal guardian argues she wouldn't have signed if she was mentally fit. I truly believe that because, like I said, Wendy, you know, certain the ticks that we saw from Wendy, Wendy would not take her wig off on camera ever. She did it in that damn document, that docu series. She would never show her real hair. She's mentioned that in many. If you were Wendy Nixon, you know the tea. There were many things that was going on in that docu series that Wendy was doing that she would never do in real life. That's how I knew there was something wrong with her. Well, I've been knew there was something wrong with her, but it was the confirmation was there. And they said reportedly Wendy inked the deal in early 2023. Actually, um, oh wait, no, I can't. I was about to change over the thing. I said, we haven't gone to the other article. Let me continue. So Wendy was inked the deal in early 2023, right before she was officially diagnosed with progressive aphasia and frontal temporal dementia. In the agreement, the network stated that they would pay her 100 k per episode of the four-part documentary, as well as in a $1,000 daily stipend for Glam. The Contra reportedly read, producers shall pay artists a fee of $1,000 per shoot day that is pre-approved by producers that Glam is required for the shoot day as a reimbursement for all artists and artists' associates' hair and makeup. So, there we have it. We have somebody who was in there that... um. You know, that um, how much now we know how much she was paid for the whole situation. So there's that. So um, now what we're going to do is move on to the next thing about Wendy and talk about this tax lien situation. So it seemed like, you know what, she can't seem to take a break when it comes to her money. Like her husband after her ex-husband after her money. Wells Fargo doesn't got her money all sewed up in the bank. You know, so many people are trying to get their hands on, on her money. So it says she's reportedly facing, facing a federal tax lien for more than 500 k in unpaid taxes. This is according to TMZ. The talk show host, who's 59, was hit with a lien on her New York City condo, which she purchased in 2021 for $4.5 million, according to court documents obtained by the publication. Williams reportedly failed to pay $568,451.51 in federal taxes in 2019 and 2021. The government generated the lien in January and it was recorded with the New York City Department of Finance in February per TMZ. Williams has experienced financial struggles since the the Wendy Williams show's cancellation in June of 2022. The TV personality, who went from having a $40 million net worth in 2020 to an estimated $500,000 net worth in 2024, damn, like she went through all of her money, was placed under a financial guardianship in February 2022 amid her ongoing health battle. At the time, her financial advisor declared that Williams was of unsound mind, causing her bank Wells Fargo to freeze her accounts. Williams' guardian later revealed that Sabrina Morrissey, an attorney, um, Oh, she was revealed as Sabrina Morrissey. The former radio host Money Woes were explored on Lifetime docuseries Where is Wendy Williams, which aired on February 2024 and February of the 25th. So, 
Um, we already know the whole situation and then what she's going through with her ex and all other stuff. But I really hope at this point, Jesus Christ. Um, I really hope at this point that they could work out her financial situations, her taxes and that stuff can get paid. I could have sworn, or maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. As the guardian, Sabrina needs to be figuring out who's going to be her financial advisor, who's actually going to be handling the billation situation and get her debt free and all this other stuff. I understand. I'm like, that's crazy. Like I'm reading it. Like she's, she went through her $40 million, you know, net worth. And now she's worth 500 K. How are you worth half a million dollars? But that kind of makes me wonder the money in Wells Fargo, how much is that that's in there? Like you, you're saying that her net worth is this now, but if she can't have access to the money in Wells Fargo, how much is in that account? And they did mention in the docuseries how much money she has in, you know, that she had a, a separate bank account and was probably taking that money from, you know, whatever little gigs that she was doing here and there. And they were putting it in that account that she had access to, to be able to pay for whatever needs to be paid for. But if the docuseries was, of course, paying her money, you know, being it through lifetime, then she had that money too. So I just hope that she's able to find a way to work this whole financial situation out because this is insane. Excuse me, this is insane. But let me know in, in down below what you guys think of this story. Now, I know we have... Um, Is that, is that why they let Sean take her to that meeting? Or was it them? Or what, well, the cameras was follow, was doing their job and just following um, what was going on, I guess. Or maybe they, from what they said, is they didn't even know that she they took Wendy on the flight. But it just so happened that they had an L.A. crew that they could get out to her. And I don't know, the, all the jargon. They, sometimes these people be out, out of pocket with some of the shit that they be doing. So... They were able to get a, a crew together, whatever that was part of, you know, NBC Universal, because I believe Lifetime is a part of NBC Universal, and they were able to get out there and, and film whatever. But um, I do, yeah, this is like that's crazy. How first of all, Sean is not anybody to be putting Wendy in the type of situation or anybody of of sound mind, but they weren't thinking about Wendy Williams at the time, especially when we're talking about she taking her to that NBC meeting to try to get her a talk show. And it's like, I'm going to show them my feet and I'm going to tell them I want to wear, you know, the clothes that she's been wearing, which was like tight t-shirts, booty shorts with stockings. I'm like, girl, I understand. Yo, like, girl, yo, first of all, Wendy has the tech, but I guess that's for being from Jersey. A lot of them, you know, they're fashion challenge out there. Have you looked at the Housewives of New Jersey? So that look that Wendy had is like, Girl, who dressed you? It's like you dressed in the dark. But we're not gonna shame a, a, a woman with a disability over her tacky fashion sense, <laughs> even though I just did. Um, but people should have known better. But we saw what, what Sean was trying to do, and I'm glad that she and Will no longer work for for her because Sean was looking for an opportunity. To be like, see, I got her this gig, and now we can get her. You know, now she'll probably push him out the way and make me her manager. I've got her trust because I let her do what she wants. If she needs liquor, I'm going to get her her liquor. If she wants her E-pens, I'm going to get her E-pens. So, there's that. So, yep, I'm, and that was totally true about Alex saying that she knew what she knew what she was being used. Is that if she went from $40 million to five hundred k, sounds like some people working for her were stealing from her. Well, yeah, that was implied throughout the entire situation. I do believe that, 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 that there was a sequence in the episode that we saw she's leaving stacks of money just lying around her bedroom. Like not like it's nothing. So you know somebody was in there skimming off the top. They'd be like, oh, Wendy, you need anything? You need anything, girl? Just let me know, sis. I got you. Put the stack back, stick a couple in your titties or whatever, or if you're a man in, in, in your crotch or your pocket, and keep it moving. She's so busy, dazed, and you know, on a on a high from being drunk. And in a, you know, eyes rolling the back of her damn head, half sleep. She ain't gonna notice if somebody's still on her coins. And then Will come in completely clueless. You just leaving money lying around? But anyway, let's move on. And child, there's a lot of people going dealing with with financial shit today. So let's get into Bruno Mars. 
Well, it's funny because one of my friends hit me up on social media was talking about that. People thought he was lying when he talked about it. I was like, why would anybody make up something about Bruno Mars having a gambling debt? Like, first of all, Bruno Mars is not a name that really circulates a lot in celebrity news and gossip. Except for that time he got arrested and they found cocaine, I mean, booger sugar on, on him because I didn't know it was a secret that Bruno Mars has a love for the booger sugar. That was the way people found out. And, you know, him and, and, and I didn't even know that he had, he was having an issue with, who was it that's part of a silk line? Anderson Pop? Like, they was going through some things, and they had broken up at one point. And I know now, because I didn't know what Bruno Mars was up to, but apparently now, he has a residency at the MGM Resort International. um, And he's been there since 2016. So that probably makes sense why we haven't really seen or heard from him in a while. He's just been pr promoting and performing his old music, you know, between the Bruno Mars stuff and the Silk Sonic stuff. A residency is cute. You be in Vegas, you make a certain amount of money every year. I told you, J-Lo need to jump back on that. If she wants to get some kind of money, just do a residency. Because nobody's checking for her anywhere else. <laughs> you know, people come to Vegas and see her, uh, give her showgirl tease. But anyway, let's get back to Bruno. So it said he reportedly owes MGM Grand Casino $50 million, and that's 35, 39 million pounds in his gambling debt. He recently entered the ninth year of his residency at the Park MGM in Las Vegas, which he extended with 12 shows taking place throughout 2024. Now, the 24K Magic Singer announced a multi-year residency with MGM Resorts International in 2016, performing at the Hospitality Giants Park MGM Resort in El Las Vegas. However, the relationship between the 38-year-old and the Hospitality Giant may have gone sour as the singer's gambling has allegedly picked up right sorry, racked up large debts at the poker tables in Las Vegas, according to News Nation, saying he owed millions to the MGM, a Vegas insider told the outlet. Another source added that the debt is as high as $50 million. $50 million? You know where I got that from? <laughs> MGM basically owned him. He makes $90 million a year off the deal he did with the casino, but then he has to pay back his debt. Well, if he um if he pays all the debt, he'll have forty million dollars left over. But what they need to do is keep him away from the goddamn gambling um, situation. There needs to be an in his contract that he need to stay away from the gambling tables. He need to stay away from the casino. Like I'm sure there's some GA meetings he can go to. I guess they're called Gamblers Anonymous. G I'm sure there's plenty of them out there that he could deal with going in them situations. He got to find something to do. I know uh, there's plenty of things I'm sure to do in Vegas that he can get creative and do it. But I guess maybe because he's a celebrity, he can't really go a lot of places. I don't know. But if he's making $90 million a year, why would you waste all that at the casinos? Like I said, people got their addictions. But anyway, so it says that the singer only makes $1.5 million per night after taxes. Now, part of Mars's MGM contract reportedly includes the creation of the Pinky Ring, a cocktail, a cocktail lounge inside the Bellagio Resort. News Nation reports that another project is in the works as well. In a 2013 interview with GQ's Chris Heath, Mars reminisced about his early days of gambling when he frequented the Commerce Casino in Los Angeles long before he became famous. So... That that whole addiction's been with him for a long time. He said, I used to be a, like a loudmouth. You know, the guy people would want to take his money. If you do get them to lose, they're out for you. They're gunning for you, Mar said at the time. And that's when they're weak. And that's when you jump or pounce on them. In the interview, Mars also opened up about the first time he visited a casino when he was 19, saying, I remember my first bet. My hand was shaking, and a guy called me out on it and embarrassed me. I mean, he lost $100 he couldn't afford to lose. You gotta lose. You just have to lose to win to understand. During his Carpool Karaoke episode on The Late Late Show with James Corden in 2016, Mars briefly revealed that he was able to make rent while living in L.A. by playing cards for a little while. And... um. There, the, you can see the moment if you go to my website and stuff and all this stuff. But anyway, this is insane, though. So he's always had this addiction. He said long before he was famous, and he found a way to to pay his rent while trying to pursue his career as a musician. I'm not trying to because he accomplished it while pursuing his 
you know, music career. He played cards. And, you know, when it comes to gambling, it is a gamble. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. But I think it's that adrenaline rush of the possibility of both happening is why people get caught up in it. Me, personally, I hate gambling. I hate losing money. I hate betting on things when it comes to money. I'd rather bet on, you know, if I have an idea and I take it to a studio and it comes to life and it becomes a thing, and if it does well, it does well. If it doesn't, then it's like, oh, well, it didn't work out. Let's move on and develop something else. I'd rather take a gamble with the studio than I would with a casino because it's like, now, I, I, child, now I wonder this. Is the casino like it was back in the day? You know, like with the mob and they had Al Capone. Well, you know, Al Capone was in Chicago, but um, ran Chicago, I should say. But you know, like when they have all the gangsters and all the stuff that ran the casinos in in Vegas back in the day. You know, the days of um Frank Sinatra and stuff. So I wonder if it's like, is it still like that out there? Or somebody gonna break Bruno kneecaps if he don't pay that fifty million dollar debt? <laughs> so you better get on it. And yeah, there needs to be a way that his team could find a way. But then again, I, mean, I was going to say to find a way to keep him from the slots and, and the crabs table and playing blackjack or whatever his game of choice is. But it may be hard because when you have people who work for you, you know, those are the people, the yes people that surround you. They're not going to tell you the truth. They'll keep you from the crabs table. They want you to keep doing what you're doing because it makes you happy, I guess. But, you know, addiction is a, a mother effer. It definitely screws with you. So I'll definitely keep my eye on this story as it develops, but I feel for him right now. Or maybe, or should I feel for him? Because it's like, you know what you're doing. You caught up in your own little situation. You got to figure that shit out. Okay, so, um, Felix says, I haven't heard anything about Bruno in a couple of years. That's what I said. Like, nobody's really, um, nobody's really heard from Bruno or didn't even know what he was doing. <laughs> Quite as it's kept. I really haven't been keeping up with him either, but I do agree with this post. Uh, I was wondering why Bruno never toured. Now you know why, because he's been in Vegas. Like, he'll make an appearance here and there, I mean, you know, at, like, the award shows and stuff. But for the most part, it's like, yeah, he's been quietly doing a residency, kind of like Katy Perry was. Like, I almost forgot about her until I remember hearing the article about, oh, she's finally wrapping up her residency, and now she's she's coming out with a new album, which is going to be a dance record. And possibly toward that because she's leaving America. I don't she wants to focus on her music again. So, you know, good luck to you, girl. I mean, well, I mean, Bruno. <laughs> um, okay, so let's move on and talk about Shakira, Shakira, whose new album comes out this week. I didn't even know that um, until I was doing research in the article. So in a new interview with the Sunday Times, published on March 16th, the 47-year-old Colombian superstar spoke about the sacrifice she made during her relationship with soccer star Gerard Pique. Now, here's the thing. I had no idea Pique was 10 years younger than her. I did not know, first of all, Shakira looks good at 47. Not saying that, you know, people like her should look like, you know, an old fossil. But she looks good at 47. And the fact of the matter is, I had no idea that her husband was, at the time, was 10 years younger than her. So it says, ahead of the upcoming release of her first studio album in seven years, the Whenever Wherever singer is reflecting on her musical journey and how it was affected by her relationship with former pro soccer player Gerard Piquet, from who she split in 2022, saying, for a long time, I put my career on hold to be next to Gerard so he could play football. This is what she told the Times of London newspaper in an interview posted on March 16th. There was a lot of sacrifice for love. And he clearly didn't appreciate it because he went out laying low and spreading it why with another damn woman and the worst part about it was his bitch of a goddamn mother was aware of the damn affair and put up with the shit so this is why i love the fact that shakira actually lived across from um gerard's mother and she used to taunt her <laughs> i used to hear them stories about i said shakira shady i need to find out what her damn sign is but anyway, so um, they said the Grammy winner and her ex, with whom she shares sons Milan, who's 11, and Sasha, who's 9, announced their split in June 2022 after 11 years together and five months before the star athlete retired from professional soccer. Since then, he ha- she has released several new singles, most of which will be featured on her upcoming album, which translates in Spanish, Women No Longer Cry, and is set to come out on March 22nd. 
saying there were so many pieces of my life that crumbled in front of my eyes and I had to rebuild myself in a way, picking up the bones from the floor and putting them all together. This is what she told the Times. And that glue that kept it all together was music. And that's what I always so love about musicians is the fact that they take a lot of those, they take all that pain that they were dealing with in their personal life and they put it into the music, which is what I was hoping that we was going to get from Jennifer Lopez with This Is Me Now. But all we got, you know, but, you know, with J when it comes to J-Lo, she about to go about as deep as a pond. So she's not going to really give you what needs to be given. She wants to give you all some bullshit, fake ass version of love, relationships, tumultuous times. All this. You wasn't getting no rhythm. And I think that's why people turn their nose up at her album. But the Shakira record, I'm actually looking forward to because one of the things I've always loved about Shakira is that she's always come across as authentic and transparent in a lot of the music that she does. So I'm actually looking forward to hearing about this album. And from based off the stuff I heard, she going in on PK and, and, and his new bitch because she has this... um. I think she released a song, or there's a song on the album where she basically talk. Um, she alludes to saying a she wolf like me isn't for guys like you, which is basically saying that I think he felt, you know, even though he was famous in his own right and Shakira is famous in her own right. Let's be clear, we talking football. Football is athlete sports that's a worldwide situation i mean there's people soccer fans and stuff in america too because you know they play at you know the venues and stuff out here they're gonna be playing at what yankee stadium city field if you're from new york you know they play a lot of the baseball stadiums and all the stuff so they'll, they'll be doing that but anyway so he's so he's famous in his own right but shakira is a worldwide global superstar so i could understand that you know in certain spaces especially in hollywood and stuff and in the music world, Shakira is known in so many spaces where he has his niche market, which is in sports. And there are certain people that know him from that. And when you're in a relationship with someone of Shakira's stature, regardless of the situation, sometimes a lot of these men feel inept and they feel like they can't keep up or measure up to the woman that they fell in love with and they married. So they go off and they have affairs and they go off and do other things. I'm not saying it's right, but based off of her writing that song is the fact that she probably is someone who has a stronger personality. And sometimes men can take that. <clears throat> take that, take that. And then she goes and says, as far as how her and Gerard's sons feel about that song that I alluded to, um, Shakira told the Times, they know that there's only one way to live life, and that's accepting the pain. And each one of us has different ways of doing that. And she also said that her son Milan is following in her footsteps and the way he processes um, things in his personal life. She said he wrote two songs. So I think it would be like, it would be cool. Like, I would read my, like, if I was in Shakira's situation and I was going through a breakup and I put it in my music, I would ask my son, is it okay if I can read the, you know, read the lyrics that you wrote? And if he's got that talent, I would actually bring him in. But then it, would that be a little shady though? It's like, oh, now you're trying to put my son, but be, be, you're trying to put a son between the parents and all this other stuff. I'd be like, can I use your song and actually sing it? or um, incorporate it into stuff. Or I would even put my kid in the studio, but like, you come down to the, the home studio, and if you want to record some music, like, play, I, mean, I don't know if he plays instruments, but I'd be like, if you want to work with a producer, if you want to, if you play a guitar, or whatever the case is, if you want to come in and, and do and exercise your demons through the music and kind of get that whole thing out of your system, I would definitely leave it open for my child to express themselves in that way. That, to me, feels like a more authentic way of putting out music and being creative versus this foolishness that Kanye got Northwest doing with this, what is it, elementary school dropout? That feel like some marketing shit that the father and just trying to force on their child. But if you want to go out and, and if this is something that she truly wants to do, that I'm here for. But I don't know. It feels a little stuntish to me. But this feels a little more, I don't know. It just feels natural when people sit and they talk about things instead of trying to force it on people. It also made me wonder also with the whole thing about Shakira and Jennifer Lopez with the halftime. I think I probably mentioned that yesterday. I don't remember because I told so much about these J-Lo stuff. I don't remember half the shit I say <laughs> unless I, you know, watch it back. But I was also wondering, I'm like, is that why they felt that they had to co-headline a, a Super Bowl? Because they feel like Jennifer Lopez wasn't that big of a star that she could hold down a Super Bowl by herself. 
I kind of wonder if they feel the same way about Shakira. Or it could have been also that maybe it was because, of, like she said, she didn't put out an album in seven years. So, you know, when it comes to, especially in America, out of sight, out of mind. That's why I love Kylie Minogue now, because Kylie has been spending more time in America. And I think this is the first time in her career she's actually done that, where, you know, her 35-plus year career, where she's spent more time going and growing her American audience because she spent so much time overseas in London and so many other places putting down roots with her career. So I kind of wonder if that's what Shakira's, you know, that's the reason why they had them co-headline because Jennifer Lopez never really put that much emphasis in her solo music career, not touring all that much. She didn't really do a real proper tour until her 50th It's My Party tour. So that was the only time she really went out and did like a big extravagant, you know, tour regular like a regular tour like a regular musician whereas everything else was residency in vegas occasional live recorded performance that ended up on a dvd or something and that sort of thing so i say all that to say i'm excited for this new shakira album it comes out this week hopefully we can finally a uh, man there could be a mainstream artist that finally gives me something worth listening to and being like okay now this is gonna be in my top albums of the year because no shade justin dry ass record Ariana Grande wasn't feeling it. Was the who's the other one? Um, Usher, he's pretty much been forgotten. It's like the Super Bowl thing came and went, and nobody's really talking about him. So I don't know if it's that male pop stars are just boring. Maybe that's what it is. I don't know. But whatever, Chad. All right. So uh, so I saw pictures of actors from the eighties, and some of them in their forties look like they were in their. Si- <laughs> That's why I said, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's is that the newer generation, like the, like Gen X has sort of, like the later part of Gen X, like sort of 76 to like whenever that ends. And then we have like the millennials, that whole era, like depending on what it is, that whole era is kind of like aging backwards, depending on who it is. Cause I see more people who look younger than older. Whereas a lot of boomers, child, I don't know what was in the water at that time, but you a little, I don't know, maybe you need a little moisturizer, but it's like, yeah, it's like a lot of the actors from the 80s and some of them in their 40s look like they were in their... I mean, who knows? It could have been just like, you know, Hollywood ages people and also the drugs and everything everybody was doing. She couldn't have done it alone. So yeah, I heard, I've said with Kylie that she didn't get as big in the U.S. because she never toured here. I heard before the residency, she only did nine shows in the U.S. in her whole career. Yeah, because she would do like little, like, thank you to my, it was basically like a, a thank you to her American fans, her loyal cult Tish fan base that support her in America that we never got the opportunity to see her live because the only way that I was going to be able to see Kylie live is I'd have to give me a passport and get on a plane and go see her at the O2 in London. Or she did Spain, I could go stay with friends of mine out in Spain. But, I, but back then I was just way too young to even go to a, like be able to have the courage to get on a plane by myself to be wanting to go to a concert in a foreign country. So I wasn't trying to take that risk. But um, now I'm just glad that she's finally giving America, you know, the time and the space to really come here and give us what needs to be given. Like, showing support that, you know, and growing her fan base here. So the residency is definitely helping. Then we can get that world tour. Yeah, you could do the O2 in London. You could do Australia. You could do all the other places there outside of the United States. But then come the to the United States, and I would say either do a show. I don't want, I, I don't feel like Kylie, and it's no shade. I don't think I I don't think Kylie would be able to do like arenas because even though she has been growing her fan base here, I don't feel like she would be able to sell out an arena or a stadium. I would like to, I think that she could do multiple nights at a venue that's like the size of if you're from New York, a radio city or the um oh my god what's the other the other place the theater at madison square garden which the theater is a nice is a it's a nice it's a nice arena i mean it's a nice um what do you call it it's a nice i was gonna say a nice um i was gonna say something else but it's like it's a nice i'll say theater it's the it's called the theater it's a nice theater where it's big enough you could fit enough people in there you could probably fit like five six thousand people maybe more 
And I think she would be able to sell that. You know how many gays would show up to that event? So that's definitely something that I think that she should she should do. You could do a proper tour here, but she could do smaller venues. And you can and here's the thing. I don't know why people shy away from small venues. Like I feel like you don't necessarily have to do like some big thing that like you can do what Madonna did, which is you can have a stadium, I mean, you can have an arena size show, but make it intimate and feel like a theater type of situation and kylie gives that she gives full-on production she gives full-on you know backup dancers all of the stuff and they can make that work where they make it you know cute or whatever where you can put like a little you know a a, a, a little extensive stage whatever that shit like a runway or whatever she could walk down and you have the, the dancers up there doing their thing or whatever so she can really give you all a good show and bring out props and all the other stuff you can make it work trust to believe give broadway vaudeville theater you name it she could do all of that so i don't feel like she needs to oh so felix said kylie did do an arena in 2011 in miami my friend went to see her so Maybe she could do it. Or um, I don't know. I'm always trying to... I don't know why I always think like I should sell people short when I was like, because I know what Kylie is capable of. But I just always feel like, is America on the same wavelength as I am? But maybe she could do those arena tours. You could do a Madison Square Garden. You could do an arena in like Miami. She, you go to the big cities and she could probably sell that out, no problem. Because those are more you know, liberal areas. But if she were to go to like a Tennessee or whatever the case is, I don't know if she'd be able to do the same thing. She'd probably have to do smaller venues. So it all depends on, I guess it would have to do a litmus test on where she is the most popular and not the most popular, or she would just have to do, or she could do an arena tour and it would just have to be those big city areas. And if you are a fan of Kylie and you happen to live in North Carolina and the only way that you can go see her is at, you know, some arena tour which is i don't know what's close to no i'll just throw it out there i'll say atlanta then she would have to go they would you have to take a book a flight to atlanta and go see her there that's what i would think all right so let's get to we have four more topics left and then we are done with today's show so let's get into our next topic and talk about Mauricio Umansky, who is saying that basically we're going to get a whole lot of tea about his separation from Kyle Richards. We talked about them. We talked about her yesterday. And Kyle, you know, works my root canal nerve. Well, I already said what I said in regards to the whole thing about her and Mauricio's situation. I understand, like, they, some people were saying in the comments when I posted about it, oh, she's not obligated to spill tea about her personal life. And it's like, but wait a minute, if you're on a reality show making millions of dollars, you don't get to sit and try to hide what you're talking about in regards of on a reality show. Like you're getting paid millions of dollars to be personable and forthright about your relationships. So I don't get it. <laughs> but I think it's because Bravo has allowed certain people to get away with certain things over the years. And you wonder why y'all rating is going down. But anyway, so Kyle Richards and Mauricio Umansky's marital woes have sort of played out on The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. Kyle didn't share much information, but if you were reading between the lines, it was obvious that there was trouble in paradise. There were things that happened that made me lose my trust and I wasn't able to recover from, Kyle explained in the season 13 RHOBH finale. Meanwhile, Mauricio was in Aspen and he reportedly shared some details about the couple's separation. Mauricio recently revealed that their marriage problems will also also play out on his Netflix series, Buying Beverly Hills. He shared that his wife of 26 years, just how much stress he was under, saying, I had a whole breakdown the other day in the office. Well, that was his pretty open and honest statement. Now, T according to TMZ, they said that they spoke with Mauricio last week while he was building homes in South LA in coordination with the Habitat for Humanity alongside his daughters, who are featured heavily in the season two trailer of the Netflix reality show. Apparently, the convos in the trailer aren't staged. Instead, Mauricio says cameras were set to roll on the family in Aspen last summer, the same weekend news of the separation blew up online. Mo says the fam decided not to hide their issues from the cameras and instead allowed themselves to be vulnerable for the show, something he's hoping will help members of the audience who might be going through a similar situation. And this is what I've, this is all I've been asking for in regards to this show is the fact that I'm not asking you to just slit your wrist or stab yourself in the head just to give us entertainment. 
That's not why I watch a lot of these reality shows. I feel like when a lot of times when I watch certain shows, I just want people to be open and honest and transparent about things that's going on in their life and not try to curtail around things, skip around things, try to avoid what the actual issues are. And then when people ask you, you get defensive, you get nasty, you say it's none of our effing business. When it's like you get been getting paid millions of dollars for 12 seasons or 13 seasons, how many damn seasons they've done um, to spill your personal life. That's what that's supposed to be. And the fact of the matter is, I just think that they're at this point, they're both two ships passing in the night. Kyle is finally coming into herself. She's going, I think she's going through a midlife crisis, which is coming into herself as a woman. I think for so many years, or for the majority of her life, based on how I perceived and watched her on the Real House of Beverly Hills, I feel like that she has always put so many people's opinions and feelings and things before herself and is the doting housewife and allowed Mauricio to, to build whatever he needed to build. Because remember, we talked about on the show that, and it's also in the new season that he said that why he left um, Rick Hilton's firm, real estate firm, because he said, I'm bringing in so much revenue for you. Why not make me partner? But Rick was like, I talked it over with the other partner and they said, no. Okay, well, if you're not going to make me partner, then I'm going to go off and take a gamble on myself and bet on me. You know, they always say bet on yourself, right? If you don't bet on yourself, who else will? So he went off and did his own thing and went off and tried to find, you know, took a gamble on himself and it paid off. And now he's been putting so much energy and stuff into the agency and building his own agency and coming into his own as his big mogul that it has affected his marriage to Kyle who has always been standing by him, letting him do his thing while he let her do her thing while she was on the reality show. Now, in regards to everything else, there's always been rumors that, you know what, you know, him finding himself and doing these other things and maybe Kyle wasn't giving him the emotional connection and love that he needed and vice versa. So he went off cheating and sleeping with a bunch of other women because now you're becoming this big rock star and you're traveling in all these other places and you're not getting the intimacy that you need from your wife, so you're going off getting it elsewhere. And now Kyle is over here with Morgan Wade and getting her box rubbed on and all this other mess. And now now she might be coming out of the closet because now she found love with this woman that she won't really say whether or not she found love with this woman or not. But I truly feel like she has. And then we'll find out in the next season for their storyline. Is Kyle going to slowly start coming out and saying like, you know what? She's fallen in love with someone and have like her old Niecy Nash um, moment on the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. So that's basically based off of this article and everything. I mean, that I'm reading, uh, you know, about it. I felt like that's what I took from it. And so March 22nd is when the second season of Vine Beverly Hills premieres. If you care to watch, I will admit I was not interested in watching this show. And I was like, whatever, whatever. Like, I didn't care enough about Mauricio to want to see this thing. However, I do like house reality shows. I told you I love um, Selling Sunset. That was my show because of all the drama. I loved the Million Dollar Listing. You know, back when that was popping, I missed the one with Frederick. Ever since he left, and that whole they changed up that whole dynamic, I stopped watching that one over on Bravo. But I've always liked like ho flipping home stuff and the drama and all. You know, I love HDTV. So, <laughs> uh, and then I guess growing up, we're seeing all. We're seeing, I think that might maybe spark my interest because when I was a kid, my father used to always put on. You know, we used to watch a lot of PBS growing up, and we used to watch. This old house with Bob Vila, which is where they got, uh, was it Tool Time from Home Improvement? That whole situation with that show, that was kind of like a play on 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 um This Old House. I used to come on PBS. I used to watch that as a kid growing up, and I kind of I think that got me into like building houses and developing and all the other stuff. I never really wanted to get into real estate, although I have a strange feeling. Who knows? That might that might actually be my transition in life that I might want to get into real estate. But for now. I do like watching people flip houses. I've always been kind of interested in that. And I think it's because, like I said, when I was a kid, I used to watch a lot of that stuff. So HDTV is my channel. And I definitely feel like because of all this other stuff that's coming out and, we, and he's been doing promotion, he's saying all this stuff, I might take a gander and watch his show. Now, if you bamboozle me like your wife did throughout this whole entire season of Beverly Hills Housewives, well, we still don't know the reason behind why they're splitting, but we know about there's a splitation happening then I'm gonna be pissed off, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna not give your show another uh, uh, another go around, even though I haven't even watched season one, but I will watch season two because of all this drama and stuff that's coming out. Now, 
I'm going to stick with Beverly Hills because it ain't just Kyle I got to watch. Like, I love Garcelle. I love Sutton. I love Erica. You know, a lot of the other... Dorit, who knows? I think her days is numbered. Um, Crystal, okay, says, at some point, you got to stop becoming the my Iman LePage of the show, and you really got to step out of your comfort zone and really, like, grow a backbone, speak up, give us something. Anne-Marie, please let this be a one-and-done season. I need her to be the Diana season. I can't take her, but for the most part, I'm going to stick with Beverly Hills because that's my show. It's, I heard they're going to start filming next month already, which is crazy because I guess there's so much going on. They want to capitalize on, you know, what's happening with all that's in the ether. And they need to capture that for the show because if you let that simmer and, and that stretches out for a while, you, you need to capture those moments while you can. So... I'm looking forward to the, the new season, Beverly Hills Housewives, whenever that airs. And I will definitely give, like I said before, I'll definitely check out Buying Beverly Hills when it airs later this week. Okay, chair, let's get into some queer news. And talk about this gay councilman who was out here acting a hot-ass mess. So a friend of mine sent me some stuff. Hold on, let me pull that up while I do that. Um, give me a second, a second. Where is it? Oh, I got it, I got it, I got it. I, and he sent me this, like, on Thursday. So it was a while ago that he sent me all this stuff. And I'm getting around to it today, because I told you I was so busy all last week. You know, with March Madness and everything, Um, I didn't really have time. So you're not gonna i mean i'm gonna pull up the video in a second but but let me just get to the 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 article so basically it said that there was a gay man who was with another guy they you know were discovered because a bunch of drag queens put their ass on blast so apparently what they did was there was public intoxication and urination outside of the precinct bar and one of the people was that was identified was someone by the name of chris kilpatrick a gay council member from california and they said that he designed I mean resigned design resigned days after he and his partner were allegedly caught on video urinating on the doors of precinct a popular lgbtq plus bar in la now on thursday march 14th the crescenta valley town council announced that kilpatrick resigned after precinct shared a video on social media that similarly showed him urinating in public on the exterior of the venue. The CVTC shared a statement via social media that read, Today, Council Member Chris Kilpatrick tendered his resignation from the Crescenta Valley Town Council. The resignation was accepted um, effective immediately. Now, hold on, because I'm going to pull that up right now. Bear with me, bear with me. Is that it? I believe that is. So that's the this is the letter that they pulled up. And in a second, I'm definitely gonna pull up the, the video. Which you really can't see nothing. They blur it out, but so I'm, hopefully I won't get in trouble or flagged or whatever on here. But yeah, you don't really see anything that's going on. So um so we're gonna go here and this is the video of them walking up to Precinct's door. I haven't been to Precinct in so damn long. And here they go. They said they're going to they, they go blurring it out. They just open up their situation. And then, you know, they're going at it. But anyway, so these are the two. Chris Kilpatrick is this guy here, the, the, the big dude, who resigned over you know, being a hot-ass mess and don't know how to handle his liquor. So what I heard that, they said that the urination incident took place on Saturday, March 9th. Kilpatrick and his partner appeared to be drinking at the precinct bar and subsequently exited the establishment. However, the bar only shared the video footage on Tuesday, March 12th. Probably because they didn't know who the hell he was until they posted the stuff up and then, you know, the, the gay sleuths had to get online and break down who it was. So it said late Saturday, last Saturday night, these two party boys decided to show everyone what not to do a precinct. This is what they wrote on their post. They first left the bar with full cocktail glasses in hand, then decided to go to our employee entrance, whip out their shrimp emoji, <laughs> and piss all over it together. When done, they rounded the corner where one of the managers spotted the drinks and tried to take them away. The big one reacted by physically assaulting him, throwing him to the ground. And yeah, I noticed, I understand why they did that because first of all, if you were, if you go to precinct, they have like a little outdoor area with like but it's upstairs though like you can go and you could be outside and get some air or whatever have a drink it's like 
it's kind of like a terrorist type of situation. I'm trying to remember because the last time I went to when I was in that was when I was in L.A. four years ago. I'll say Precinct was the very first bar that I went to as soon as I got to L.A. And then I went there for the Drag Race premiere. Bitch Puddin was, shout out to her, from Dragula. Went up, didn't she win Dragula also on season two? Or also, I can't remember. You know, so many people win these award shows. I mean, these uh, reality competition shows, I can't remember. But anyway, I think Bitch Puddin did win season two. But anyway, so Bitch Puddin was hosting a... Um, a drag race party, like a, like a viewing party or whatever the case was. And that's when I first met her. And, you know, bitch pudding, that's my girl. So um, I've been to Precinct. Precinct is a lovely place to go to. I also, that's the first place, that's the first time I actually met um, and became friends with Levi, who was the bartender who dated, I don't know if they're still together, but he was with Sean Morales, who was one of the pit crew of drag race back in the beginning stages. So I think um, Levi does real estate or something now, if I'm not mistaken. But um, one of my friends, and he said this, I'm, surpri I'm surprised you ain't post this on your website. And I'm like, yeah, because I've been busy, so I haven't had time to really do it. So I said, you know what, I'll save it for the show, and I'll talk about it here. So I can understand why if you went outside, you went up to the door, you went to urinate on the door, y'all are holding drinks in your hand, you're not supposed to do that because if a cop comes by, then it's like, okay, so now y'all going to get arrested. There might be a situation that happens where precinct is fine for letting people go outside of their establishment to carry alcohol because you can't do that i know they let people have that leeway when it was during the pandemic like you could buy drinks and you could take it and go for a walk as long as it was kept in a situation where it wasn't like over exposed well, there was exceptions to that and that was during the pandemic now we're not in a pandemic no more so y'all can't be running around doing stupidness but this goes to show that this guy clearly does not know how to handle his liquor and um, like I said before, it's that pe former contestant RuPaul's Drag Race and the Boule brothers were the ones who identified them. And in an email sent to out, Kilpatrick's attorney, John Duran, disputed the alleged assault described in the Instagram post shared by Precinct. The attorney wrote, the first individual grabbed my client aggressively asking if he had been at the Precinct bar. My client instinctively pushed back in self-defense. It was reasonable for him to believe that they were about to possibly be gay bashed excuse me, by these two individuals. Huh? Since the statement was issued, Kilpatrick resigned his city council seat with Crescent Valley. Moreover, his ded he's, his dedicated biography page on the CT uh, CVTC website has also been deleted. And they said that, you know, there's no word if he'll place, you know, he'll face any charges for the act of public urination, alleged assault accusations, and or for allegedly having an open alcohol beverage in public. And that's what I was saying before. Like, you cannot have open alcoholic beverages out in public. That is a fine. And then public urination, don't you have to um, register as a sex offender or something for indecent exposure? Like, I was hearing stuff like that. But anyway, child, people took to the comments, but let's read those. Willem said, I'm so mad on behalf of the staff. And Ted, Chris Kilpatrick in it and called him trash. Another person, Landon Sider, shout out to her, who was the first drag king, I believe, to win Dragula said 100 percent american in the profile is such a red flag delta work posted gross um madame laqueer put not acceptable so gabriel the queen which one of you la queens gonna tag them <laughs> and then some people was like they was already been tagged so miss mamas calm down um i said i knew if i knew them and then miss bitter betty put messy so um we get what you was coming from. But yeah, when I would read throughout the whole thing, it was, they were um, tagged throughout on what was going on. And so, yeah, that's them. And then this is probably what they ended up looking like when they was drunk. So there you have it. Don't be out here being a mess. When y'all... Um, out here drinking. This is going to show that people clearly just don't know how to handle their damn liquor. But I was trying to see, because I think he handed me, he sent me something else that I had closed out. Um, yeah, because I think I'm, I'm just like trying to make sure. Um, I don't know. I was trying to see if there was anything else. I mean, there was a bunch of comments and stuff that people sent me on, I mean, that was sent to me on Instagram and said, which part is it fitting exactly? The part with uh, with video evidence where he pissed in a public space or the part with eyewitness accounts that prove he assaulted an employee of the establishment he was visiting? Just curious. And that's what I wanted to allude to because, and I was trying to remember that because I was like, I knew I read that somewhere. While they were saying that, oh, it was a, like he wasn't 
Um, he was it was self defense because he thought it was gonna be gay bash. I'm like, huh? You ain't even seen the person that was working in the bar that was coming up to you. Why would he bash you? And then there were eyewitnesses that basically said that he assaulted the manager. And another person, if what other proof do you need? Then Jeremy Lucido comments and says, I can confirm everything you are hearing about this week is 100% true. There is video footage and eyewitness and a long history of behavior. Honestly, accountability and looking within is what he should focus on. I had no idea he was a council member and this would cause such a headache for you, but facts are facts. So um, this goes on and on and on and says that these are not allegations because someone went and posted that they were allegations. And... If it's not an allegation, then people should just go and abide by what is said. So it is what it is. I'll keep an eye on the story as it develops, but that was just, you know, I just want to do that story because it's what's going on. I, I counsel members, I ain't acting a damn fool. And shout out to my LA brethren who's out there, you know, doing what they're doing. Oh, okay. So, oh, he said, breaking news, breaking news. Child, where you been? And I know you went to, to the Madonna concert. Um, I still haven't heard your overall thoughts of that, but anyway, it said the venue found out Friday night, but they, they're they messy. Fans are just fun finding out now. Smoothie Center and Live Nation or Nikki's teams fumbled the bag by not actually announcing it. The venue is still taking purchases last minute for the canceled show, etc. But yeah, it's a effed up mess. confused by this because you said their fans are just finding out now about what but it said that nikki's teams fumbled the bag by not actually announcing it the venue is still taking purchases last minute for the canceled show wait so there's a there's a show that was canceled that people are still buying tickets for it where she's not actually going to show up to is that what you're saying because i saw armand wiggins did a story about um about her on her Rolling Loud performance, and he basically, he basically, um, said what I've been saying for years: the hype around Nikki has always been bigger than the execution, especially when it comes to her live performance. And like, yeah, she looks good and all this other stuff. I don't don't understand why she don't just stand in one spot and just let the dancers and the props and everything do all the work while she just raps her hits. Because when she tries to give you choreography, when she tries to give you like. Madonna tees on stage or Beyonce, it doesn't go, it doesn't bode well for her because he was just like, she was underwhelmed. And I said, that's always been the case with her, with her live performances. Like, she's a beast with her pen game. She's a beast when she raps. She's a beast with them videos. You know, she puts together good videos, or at the time she did, but as a live performer, she has never been the type that has given a real good live performance. And I've always said that, that the hype is always bigger than the execution. It seems to be not just with her, it's with a lot of these so-called stands that like to prop up and hype up their their faves, and they give mid. That's always been the case. But when I say it, I'm a hater. I don't know what I'm talking about. I need to shut up. And it was all this stuff. But it's like, it's funny. Like other people say it and it's the same shit. It's like, it's a fact. Why do y'all, we need to stop celebrating mediocrity. Oh, so Robert said that's basically what, so I did um, decipher the situation. So that is what it was, is that it was canceled. It said um, the New Orleans show was canceled abruptly. So shows are getting canceled, and it's probably because, you know, like that thing we said before when I was talking about the Jennifer Lopez situation, and the neighborhood talk was talking about it, and then all you see in the comments, see, they were saying it about Nicki Minaj, and she's selling out this, and she doing this, and I was like, can y'all keep this girl's dick out your mouth for once and just focus on the, the story at hand and stop always trying to drag other people into y'all conversations to make y'all stupid ass fucking point? Like, I just don't get it. So she's quietly canceling dates and not notifying people because the tickets aren't selling. So I don't get it, but nobody's talking about it. And it's funny, this stuff is coming out, but the fandom ain't saying nothing. So y'all want to talk about Jennifer Lopez abruptly canceling things without notifying her team, I mean, the, about, without her team notifying the fans as to why. It just goes to show, like, you just y'all just don't give a F about your fans, that y'all would do something like this. But anyway, let's get to um, our final two topics, and let's talk about um, 
Queer Eye, which I don't know about this. So um, this is shout out to Out Magazine for this article. So Irish chef and journalist Stuart O'Keefe is alleging that he was originally cast to be the food expert on Netflix's Queer Eye reboot, but was shocked to find out he had been replaced by Anthony Porowski via an Instagram post. O'Keefe was talking to his guest, Zach Peter, on his podcast, Don't Let It Stew. Oh, that's perfect. But it says STU. When he revealed that he was originally cast in the Netflix show and saying, quote, so back when we they were casting, I went for casting, I went for the show, and I actually got chosen. Like, I was one of the five, he revealed. We were in the room. I was in group, um, I was in one group of five. There was another group of five. They came in and said to us, you're the Fab Five. We all went outside the room screaming, jumping up and down. I was like, let's get a photograph. This is such a great moment for us, O'Keefe said. He shared the picture of him alongside Tim Frounce, uh, Bobby Burke, Karama Brown, and Jonathan Van Ness that they took at the time. And so y'all could see, let me pull up the picture. Um, oh, wait, did I? Um, wait, hold on. Oh, no, it's showing the, um, the other thing. Why is it not showing the picture? Or maybe what it was, I should have pulled. Oh, wait, let me let me pause it. So let me leave it there so y'all ready to see what it's like. First of all, he's good looking. I would have liked to see him on the show. But um, anyway, so O'Keefe said that as the weeks went on, he was told that filming would begin soon. He started to worry about his lack of contact or lack of contract. When he asked the other members of the Fab Five if they got contracts, they all said yes. Cut to we all go to dinner. Tan doesn't go to dinner with me, so... The other four do. I'm like, why is he not coming to dinner? So I'm like, something's up. Something knows. Some Somebody knows something. He was kind of like being a bit of a dick. And I was like, oh, this is weird. Oki revealed that then he was asked to come in and audition again. And two days later, I get pulled out and Anthony gets pulled in. So it seemed like production was trying to save face where it was like, oh, well, Tan wanted this other kid to come in. I mean, were they fucking at the time? Because it was like, how do you... Um, I want to know what Tan's connection is with Anthony for him to want to be like, okay, let's pull him in. And how does Tan have more pull over what's going on with this new Queer Eye assessment where he gets to have rank over, okay, so I don't like this guy. Can we try to bring someone else in who might be... Well, I don't know what their ages are, but somebody who would be younger and I guess easier on the eyes. Well, I have to say this O'Keefe dude, he's good looking. Anthony gives me twink teas. Like I don't, I'm, I don't get into the whole twink thing. I was like, no, you got to eat a bit of a sandwich. And that's no shade to the twinks. I'm just saying. Um, so um, they said the production company wanted me on the show. I'd done other shows with them. They were like, you'd be perfect for this. You'd have you have a cookbook out. It all ties in perfectly. This is what he said. My agent called me. He's like, look, I know this sounds kind of shitty, but they said they kind that you kind of have done too much stuff. That don't make no damn sense. But anyway, as I had a cookbook and I'd done multiple shows before where the other four hadn't. So they were like, they kind of want everybody on the same level. I was like, okay, that kind of a lame excuse, but fine, I guess. But the worst part was I found out on Instagram that I didn't get it, that they swapped me out, which was real shitty. And then the production company called me. They were like, we're really sorry. We didn't know the assistant was going to post the video. I was like, I'm fine. I'll just like cry for the next year. Okeem said that he has also heard a rumor that original queer eye for the straight guy food expert Ted Allen may have advocated for the casting of Porowski, who was his friend and assistant at the time. So maybe it wasn't necessarily Tan. And I definitely want to see the um the thing. So maybe it wasn't necessarily Tim. Maybe it was like when they said the rumor, Ted Allen, because Ted Allen had ties to the original Queer Eye and pushed for someone that he knew. And, and you know, and as always in this industry, it's not even about whether y'all got chemistry or um whatever. It's always about who you know and sometimes who you blow um will get you your foot in the door. And that's what seems to be this situation. I don't know what, um, if they did something together, as in Ted and Anthony, but he wound up getting a gig, and it's unfortunate that this guy had to be the sacrificial lamb for somebody else to come in and get a gig that he was promised to get. And unfortunately, this is the name of the business, that he was just treated the way he was treated, but that's some BS. But look, um... 
I don't know what else to say on that. Let's move on. <laughs> okay, so um, let's get to our final con- um, our final topic and talk about Wayne Brady, who is opening up about life after being pansexual. So seven months after coming out as pan, the 51-year-old shared his love life is better than ever. Now, in an interview ahead of his hosting gig at the 2024 Glam Media Awards, Wayne Brady shared how his DMs changed after he came out as pansexual last year. Saying, you know what? Yes, my DMs are popping and it's amazing. This is what he told E! News ahead of the hosting gig. I've never gotten an eggplant in my inbox. It's shocking. Much respect to women. I'm sorry. I know you feel when a random guy just goes, hey, I like you so much. I'm going to show you my junk. Like, no, bro, this isn't necessarily the calling card that I want, but I'm flattered. Thank you. Brady also added that despite getting attention from everybody, he's currently single. The 51-year-old television host and actor explained that he's excited about hosting the Glad Media Awards, saying, I wanted to inspire change. I'm so free because even educating others about what it means to be pansexual, I had to educate myself about what it means to be a pansexual. What's that journey? You ask yourself, wait, am I gay? Am I bi? Am I this? Am I attracted to her, to him? This is weird. Is that right? The answer is all of the above. I'm free to love any damn body that I want to. And with that knowledge and that freedom, I feel like an adult now. In December of last year, Brady also said he received a lot of support since coming out as Pan in August of 2023, saying, I got so many DMs, emails, and texts from people at a midpoint in their life want to express themselves, whether it's changing their work or coming out. It's never too late to take hold of your story. For teenagers, young adults, theater students, and young Black men who question the idea of masculinity and what it all means. And so, shout out to Wayne. I'm definitely here for all of that because I feel like, like I said, the same thing with Kyle Richards. I feel like, you know, with her and, of course, with Niecy Nash, you know, they hit a midpoint in their life where they came to terms with, you know what? I don't know what necessarily it means, but I have feelings for this person of the same sex, and now I'm trying to just figure things out, and I'm questioning things, and all that other stuff. So, I'm all I'm here for you know people coming out at any point in their life. You know, I always say like you can't force or rush people to come to terms with their sexual orientation or who they are and all this other stuff. Everybody come out in their own time, and whenever you're ready, you know, we'll we're here to hold the door open and welcome you with open arms. So welcome to the family, Wayne. I'm glad that you're getting, you know, a lot of people sliding your DMs and want to give me that. First of all, I have to say this. I was never really into Wayne Brady before, and I never really looked at him like that. But I have to say, ever since he came to terms with who he is and fully let the... It seems like you can always tell a shift in people whenever they take all that excess weight off of their shoulders. And I was looking at him like, you know what? He can get some of that. Um, I'm, I'm like, bring me a piece of that them chick. He got a big old butt. So <laughs> I was like, I would, you know, if I ever came across Wayne Brady and we, I shot my shot and he went for it, I'd hit it. Um, he is a good looking man. And I love the fact that, you know, like I said, I love when people come to terms with who they are and just like embrace whatever. So whenever you come, you know, they always say it gets greater later. So if you ever feel at that moment that you, you're ready to change careers or you want to, you know, change partners. If you're not happy in your marriage, move on. If you're not happy with the place that you live, move somewhere else. If you're not happy, you know, putting on this image of just like, I am I have feelings for men, but I just don't want to act on it. You feel like I'm, I'm tired of hiding. Come out that closet, kick that motherfucking door all the way wide open and bust on through. It's a roller blades and some booty shorts and twerk. And twerk. Okay, <laughs> let me stop. But yeah, so shout out to you, Wayne. I'm glad you you felt you found the coverage of finally living your truth. Okay, so I see we have a comment. Um, it said any recommendations for gay films or shows? I know there's um, what is it? All of Us Strangers is on Hulu. I need to, like I said, I need to catch that and watch that. I don't know if you have Deku, but they have some really good um queer content on there. Also, you know what I've noticed has had some really good queer content, although I hate the commercials. <laughs> Tubi got some good gay stuff on on there too. Um, if you got Tubi and it's free, definitely check out their LGBT section because they got some some pretty good gay stuff on there. I do I am a subscriber to Deku, so I so I catch little things on there here and there. Um, but yeah, I do need to catch up on some um some queer movies and TV shows and stuff. There doesn't seem to be a lot of queer based 
TV shows that are out there. You know, we hear the things that, you know every now and again from Netflix, but Netflix we quit to cancel stuff. So that's why I really don't invest in Netflix shows all that much. I'll just be waiting a couple of years and then I'm like, I'll jump in. But yeah, there's that. Actually, you know what's a good idea? Check out my friend Victor Yates on YouTube. I don't know why this is just kind of me. You know, Victor comes in here every now and again. He's someone um, on his YouTube channel. He does a lot of videos of recommendations of queer movies, TV shows, what's going to be released, what's coming out, or what's doing the festivals and stuff. So if you get a chance, definitely look him up, V-I-C-T-O-R-Y-A-T-E-S. Check out his stuff over on YouTube. He does, I think he did a video that I saw maybe a couple of what was maybe a week or two ago where he posted um some movies and tv shows and stuff up on there so yeah definitely check him out because he always does like really good movie and tv show recommendations especially if it's lg you know part of the gay community and stuff so that's a recommendation i almost forgot to do that but thank you for bringing that up oh you know you say he knows victor so yeah definitely check that out so um let's see All right, so we are officially at the end of today's show. Thank you all for tuning in for the latest episode of Chris Avalon Unfiltered. Please do yourselves a solid and hit that like button, that subscribe button, and that notification button so that way you know when we go live with a brand new episode of Chris Avalon Unfiltered. Once again, thank you all for watching. Thank you all for having me on the background while you're probably doing your cleaning or or whatever it is that you're doing around the house or traveling, walking around the streets or whatever the case is. I truly appreciate all of you that tune into the show and and show your support and comment and the lives and all of the stuff. But anyway, I love you all. And until next time, ciao, darlings.